welcome to the Lover's Hole. You're with Mike and Ian. And we are reading through the Aubrey Matron canon of Patrick O'Brien. We're getting to the end of the Commodore, Ian. Give us a little catch up where we are and tell us what we have in store this week. With great pleasure, Mike. Last time, as you probably remember, in Chapter 8, Jack Aubrey's squadron had sailed into Freetown, demonstrating shock and awe firing on the captured slave by the Nancy. The shore raids thereafter had captured eight more slave ships. Stephen had tried to restrict shore leave in Freetown right after sunset and accidentally thereby cancelled his own nature time ashore there. He met his intelligence contact, Mr. Humuzios, and then the squadron had sailed for Phillips Island. Stephen and Jack, along the way, had got to talking about Pottos, and the second lieutenant of the Thames and the marine officer from the Stately had almost come to blows at dinner. Meanwhile, Stephen and the crewman, John Square, had gone off naturalising on Phillips Island. So, Mike, this time, Stephen's shore leave karma is going to come home to roost. We get an education about Yellow Jack. We get an increase, if that was even possible, in intra-squadron tension. We make it to the bite. We make it to the great slave market. We face weather setbacks. We meet a new potto and a potto-loving woman. Mm. We discuss sodomy in the Navy, and we hear from home. With all of this, Mike, can the squadron still leave in time to catch the French? I wonder. I wonder too, Ian. Well, we're we're back. We're with Stephen. It's you know several days after his journey, as you mentioned, with Square uh, up the side and river on Phillips Island, and he's starting to write his notes from the journey. He's already told Jack in the intervening days about all this wonderful wildlife and plants and beetles he'd seen, including the potto that he saw from a distance, but said he didn't shoot because. He's not naturalist enough and added that Jack wouldn't have shot him either. But he did shoot what he believes to be a nondescript fishing vulture and says he intends to name it after the Bologna. And I thought for certain, you know, there's going to be some vulture with Bologna in its name. There is, but it's on Magi, the world of magic, which came way after Patrick O'Brien. So maybe we can stick a social media reference out to Bologna, the bearded vulture here. Not an African vulture, but a cute one in anatomy. Yeah. Well, besides cute vultures, we've also finally had some short time for Stephen. He's been busy. There'd been some malarial fever amongst those who had raided Sherbra and also amongst some slaves on those captured slavers. And those guys are in a bad way. The slavers, two Dutchmen and the Dane, were all sent to Freetown with prize crews. Now, the squadron's two deckers, that's the heavy sailing Thames and the lighter, more nimble Aurora, had put to sea out beyond the highest trees horizon way out the sight of land heading for the bite of benin and they were communicating with the laurel who in turn communicated with the inshore brigs now this is stephen's first chance to arrange the specimens that he's brought back to skin his birds and to label everything before the sheer quantity overwhelms his memory and even though he has this picture of seeing the fishing vulture clearly in his mind Mike, we start to wonder what might be happening here when Stephen's memory starts to let him down. The names, the times of day, the sequence of events were less clear and would not yield to the mental effort he could bring to bear. And this was not just a man in late middle age struggling to remember where he put his car keys. We get this really awkward feeling of foreboding here as Stephen notes that he feels languor, muscle pain, incipient headache and stupidity. Yeah, that doesn't sound good boy no. so Stephen does what all of us have done so often you know he goes to find jack who he knows is going to have some coffee he you know he downs the coffee he rolls a modest ball of coca leaves he's trying to husband his store right now and not run out but neither of them seem to help very much so he finally takes himself over to the mirror for a bit of self-diagnosis and he sees a scarlet tongue a ferrety look around the edges of his eyes and his lips appear rouged And he checks his body temperature. It's a little bit above 100 on his Fahrenheit thermometer, almost the same as the surrounding air. And he consults with his assistant, Mr. Smith. And again, I was I was surprised at this reference of Fahrenheit's thermometer. You know, we're still some of the folks, I think some of the few in the world holding on to Fahrenheit here. (laughs) Real, real thing, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit invented the mercury and glass thermometer and invented a temperature scale to go along with it that some of us still measure by uh, back in the early 18th century. Anyhow, on this occasion, the Fahrenheit thermometer is the vital diagnostic tool that starts Stephen off on his initially suspicion and then bit by bit diagnosis of what's the problem here. Smith confirms that he had seen plenty of cases of yellow fever in Bridgetown. He says it was their chief killer. Younger officers depended on it for promotion as their seniors died. And Stephen asks Smith to take him, Stephen, into a good light so he can be examined. And Smith says, with one exception, the doctor has all the characteristics of a patient in the first stadium, in the first stage of yellow fever. But he prays, he says, that he's wrong. The one exception is the lack of visible anxiety and the, what, he, what he would have expected to find as a strongly felt oppression about the precordia. That is to say, kind of mu muscle tenderness around the, the, the muscles and tissue at the front of the heart and the thorax there. This particular sign had never been absent in any case that Smith had seen and was considered to be most significant in Barbados. But yet, yeah, here we are with the presumably the Bite of Benin variant of uh, potentially yellow fever here. Stephen thinks, well, I can explain that partly because he's never seen a patient fortified by cocaine. And he says he'll treat it in any case as a case of nascent yellow fever and he'll dose himself. Uh, have we got any Columba root left? No. Well, okay, he says I'll use Radix Serpentariae Virginiae and a large quantity of bark, which rolled just about off my tongue there. Radix uh, Virginia creeper root, allegedly good for the stomach. Uh, Columba root as an African root uses a mild tonic. He's not got really first-class pharmaceutical help here when it comes to staving off a killer like yellow fever. Now, and it, it's interesting because Stephen's, you know, he's gone to Smith. Smith's seen this before, but Stephen wants to make sure he gets him on board before he agrees to have Smith treat him. So he says, you know, you got to agree not to bleed or purge me since there's no fluid buildup. All I want is warm water tinged with coffee and a little sponging, but no foolish effusion. You know, I don't want you pouring lots of cold water into me trying to lower my fever down. And Smith agrees. I says, you know, I'll do what you said. Stephen says, good. I want dim light, as much peace and quiet as possible on a man of war. And I want my coca leaves in easy reach here. Now, Stephen doesn't believe yellow fever is infectious, but he knows his shipmates are probably going to be really upset if he's close by. So he asked to be put in his Orlop cabin after they sweep out all these West African cockroaches, which have been breeding in there. Oh, boy. Just the, the idea of West African cockroaches doesn't sound great, does it? Um, so w waiting for this clean out to take place, Stephen's waiting in the wardroom and he's looking back at the ship's wake. He thinks. Well, I know Yellow Jack kills 80 out of 100 people, so the odds don't sound great if you take it in its generality. He says, though, he has a cast iron will to look after Diana and to be there for Bridget and Clarissa. As a physician, he thinks that all other things being equal, patients who gave in, either from terror or pain or a want of spirit, want of appetite for life, did not survive. Whereas those with an urgent desire to live without the loss of so much as an hour, those with an enchanting daughter, an ample fortune, a collection of almost certainly unknown phanerogams, well, that, that particular line of thinking is interrupted by a youngster with a message saying the Commodore would be happy to see the Doctor at his leisure. I mean, phanerogams are a, a class of plants, by the way. I think we've had that one before. But I'm thinking... Stephen is waiting to go and retire to the Orlop to kind of brew his yellow fever and potentially, you know, not get through it. Meanwhile, he's standing in the wardroom and he's now invited for some social chat in Captain Aubrey's cabin. I would have put a paper bag on my head and gone and hidden in the Orlop right away. But anyhow. Yeah, as you say, he, he climbs to the quarter deck, you know, his knees strangely weak. And Tom and Jack are trying to write our account of what's happened since they arrived on station. And they're asking Stephen to help spiff this up with his, you know, elegant turn of phrase. And, you know, Stephen has suggested a word. They've asked for the spelling and Stephen doesn't reply. And they turn around, they see him gasping. And Jack pulls the bell line, calls for the surgeon's mate, has Killick get ready a cot, a nightshirt and a chamber pot. Both surgeons, assistants and Killick are there like in a minute. And Stephen is, as the text says, overwhelmed by kindly insistence. Jack says, infection be damned. I had a touch of the yellow jack in Jamaica when I was a boy. I was salted. Beside, it ain't infectious. 
And Tom, you know, hearing that they were going to take him to the oil up. No, he says the doctor needs fresh air, not the stink of the bilge in the oil up. So, you know, Stephen finds himself back in the, the main cabin in his familiar cot with a jug of lukewarm water tinted with coffee and coca leaves right there. His fever mounts. He has a rapid pulse, fast breathing, but he settles himself in for this coming trial. And we're settling ourselves in too, right? It's, it's, it's very touching how quickly and acutely Tom and Jack react here. Everybody, you know, wants to help the doctor. It's absolutely true. Yellow fever is very, very often fatal. Yellow fever is indeed not infectious from person to person. It's, it's spread by mosquito bites, as, you, as we might have guessed. And Mike, I, there's a little writing gesture that O'Brien uses now. And I was reminded of the, the time we got introduced to James Dillon back in Master and Commander, where they kind of broke up the different perspectives of the morning, signposting through the chapter. Here he's using the textbook description of the stadia, the stages of yellow fever, as the signposts for the stages through this first part of the chapter here. Beginning with the first stadium. The opening day of the disease, the kindness, sees much dozing. Though, in spite of the moderately elevated animal heat, the sensation of chill returns. At this time, the tongue is moist, rough. The skin moist with an often profuse sweating. So, that's where Stephen is. And in Stephen's experience of this first stadium, he asks Smith to talk him through these three stages, talk him through the events, and Smith starts with the second day of the first stadium, that is to say, today, the day that they're in. He says there's going to be diminished restlessness and moving around. There's going to be increased dark or bloody urine. There's going to be muscle pain, sweating, despondency. And Stephen says it's important for patients to realize that despondency is part of the disease and not to feel like a settled kind of mood upon them so they can be armed against it. And Smith, with great composure, is trying to be very, very calm and neutral through this. Yes, sir, he says. Pray Show me your tongue. And it's really amazing that that between the two of them trying to learn from their first-hand experience of the disease, Stephen especially, because he's never seen it before, and they're kind of treating it in this very dispassionate, scholarly way. Smith says there will be heavy vomiting and great weakness to come. And Stephen confirms his weakness as he holds up um, a wine glass to his lips to try to take a drink. And uh, it, it, it's not only Stephen and Smith who were reflecting on what the disease might mean here, Mike. No. Interestingly, up in the tops, two seamen are talking. You know, the text says, ah, so the doctor would not let us go ashore for fear of the fever. And it's him. It's got the yellow jack. Ah, ha, ha, ha. He wouldn't let us go. And now he's got it himself. God love us. The other seaman says, you had better not tell that to Barrett Bonden or he'll serve you out like he served Dick Rowe. And he's laughing the other side of his face now, what face he has left. So <laughs> I, I love this perspective. I also loved, uh, you know, the, the little potty humor, Dick Rowe, right? This is guys <laughs> being guys, right? Don't you, you wish ill on my mate here? Yeah, I'll serve you right out. No, indeed. Or well, Barrett Bonden will on my behalf. Gosh. Right. And so we get to the second signpost. The second stadium, says the the textbook quoted here in the text for us, pulse weak and a declining, but no fever. Indeed, the bodily heat is less than the ordinary degree of warmth. Extreme restlessness and yellow suffusion of the eyes and the person. Black vomit. Still greater despondency, prostration, delirium. This stadium lasts an indeterminate number of days before either ceasing entirely or merging with the third. Mm. For Stephen, he has more of a waking dream than kind of that raging fever, perhaps because of the coca leaves. He's aware of Jack quietly moving about the room, talking in a low voice, giving him a drink, holding him up to vomit. At one lucid point, he hears a man on the poop tell another one not to go near the skylight. The air coming from the surgeon is mortal. The other replies that Killick says it's not catching. The first says, well, then why does Killick run in to deliver the doctor's food, holding his breath with charcoal in his mouth and rushing out to wash his face with vinegar and Gregory's cordial? And the guy says, you know, I've seen so many men die of this that the land crabs were tired of eating them up. Oh, (laughs) I I love the fact that everybody's potentially victim to the kind of superstition and ambiguity there is about whether it's catching or not. And that no, nobody's really willing to be as brave in their actions as they are in their, in their words here. But anyhow, here we get 
the third stadium. Pulse, though soft, becomes exceedingly small and unequal. The heat about the precordia increases much. Respiration becomes difficult with frequent sighs. The patient grows yet more anxious and extremely restless. Sweat flows from the face, neck, and breast. Deglutination, which is swallowing, becomes difficult. Subsultus tendinum comes on, jerking tendons. The patient picks the nap of his bedclothes. Coma may last 8, 10, or 12 hours before death. So, Stephen, if he's going to follow the regular course of yellow fever, is close to the end here. And it's really unsettling that the textbook particularly picks out this detail of the patient picking the nap of the bedclothes. It's both a very, a very ancient way for a textbook to record it and a very odd kind of almost cold kind of detail to pick up on there. Right. Well, Stephen hears again outside the cabin there. The Loblolly boy helped to sponge him, says he's never seen a body so yellow, like a guinea all over with purple spots. The doctors say if he don't look up in a couple of days, they'll put him over the side come Sunday when church is rigged. And uh, I just, and for me, yeah, you know, O'Brien set this, you know, first, second, third stadium march, kind of like a drumbeat tightening the noose. And then we've got this ominous pronouncement. And as is so often the case, darkness sometimes coming right before the dawn. Mm. So... Sunday, rather than being written like a medical textbook, it starts to be written a little bit in the tone of the ship's log. Sunday came and went with no funeral. And on Tuesday, Smith and Macaulay came and said, Sir, we are now convinced you have avoided the third stadium. Your pulse, though still faint, is a delight to feel, so regular and true. Your excrements are a pleasure to inspect. Which of us can say that, eh, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> the inner loss of blood has been negligible since Friday, and already your strength is returning. You can almost raise a half-filled glass. Your voice reaches the stern gallery. It will be a long, long, very long while before you can roam the forest again. Yet even so, we feel that we may now properly congratulate you and give you joy of your recovery. Give you joy, sir. Give you joy of your recovery, said Macaulay. And both gently shook his hand right uh, j j just a few paragraphs and we've gone from despair to this really really touching moment it really is awesome i you know i have to credit o'brien he could have milked this much longer and yep. unlike past dramas we you know we don't go chapters waiting to find out what happens nevertheless in this very short span of pages it's so masterfully written that I was, in, I was in doubt, and I cheered. I cheered this yeah. paragraph. My eyes dampened a little yeah. bit. And, and like you say, Ian, I mean, not many of us can say that our excrement is a pleasure to inspect. So what a great thing, Stephen. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So we've noticed that Jack has matured and grown wiser and a bit more insightful. It actually appears that Stephen, uh, on a very, very long slow burn, is slowly becoming a better and more insightful, more self-aware patient. I say very slowly. It's a great while before he can get to the stern gallery unaided, and he is sickened at the state of his own invalidity. He says to Jack, Sickness has innumerable squalors, many of which you know far too well, my dear. And among them, in some ways the nastiest, is the sufferer's total selfishness. And... He's seeing himself for how he really is. Uh, but not just any sufferer, particularly Stephen as the sufferer, is a pretty self-centered cove. So he tells Jack that he remembers some of what Jack had mentioned about the mission while he was sick. Uh, none of us have heard it, of course, because this is all gone by in the, in the twinkling of a couple of paragraphs. So he's helping us out to a bit of uh, retrospective continuity here. He says he's ashamed he's got no idea of where they are and how successful they've been. Well, Jack says the reason for that is that Mr. Smith had told them not to disturb or excite Stephen. Stephen had been asleep when some of the most exciting things had happened, such as the Aurora and the Laurel running down the big Havana schooner. And Mike, this wouldn't be Patrick O'Brien without some big actions and plot points being described very briefly and in very much reported speech here. Well, 
Jack tells him the mission is almost at an end. They're about to run down to the Bight of Benin. The inshore brig should soon be raising Whitehall, the great slave market. And once that's complete, Jack's going to give command of the inshore vessels to Henslow, the senior brig commander, while the rest of the squadron heads to St. Thomas to pick up the southeast trades and head back for Freetown. Yeah, they want to be off away back to Freetown and chasing the French. <laughs> they've been more successful than anyone could have expected. Jack tells them they've taken 18 slavers, 6,120 slaves released, including men and women. And Jack is going to have Huell, who's seen all the action. Jack hasn't because he's been back with the, the big ships. Yeah. He's going to have Huell yeah. tell Stephen all about it when he comes aboard tomorrow. Huh. And I, I, It's funny. We've had very little direct contact you know, face-to-face -face descriptions or dialogue with Huell. But I really, really like the guy. There's something about where he's been and the role that he's played and also who he is that I think is really warming to me as one of the great secondary characters in the book. Anyhow, our liking for Huell and the general kind of upbeat tone about the end of the mission isn't quite paying off for Stephen. He says, Jack, you're looking sad, worn, and anxious. And... He says he understands if Jack wants to offer a civil evasion to slightly dodge the subject, that he doesn't want to force a, a confidence, but he can't help noticing, he says, that Jack's violin playing, which has been his great sustaining activity for all these weeks, is speaking pian pianissimo and always in D minor. Has the poor ship a hidden leak that cannot be come at? Must she perish? And Stephen is offering this very uh, kind of glaring, potentially do me uh, an analysis of Jack's mood, probably in order to offer Jack the chance to, to downplay it. But it's noticeable. D minor, by the way, is the key of the famous Chacon that Jack played uh, to himself when he and Stephen had first been discovering Bach back in, I think, the Ionian mission. So maybe not an accident that it was D minor. Anyhow, Jack says he'd never really liked the idea of leading from behind and the death of all these young men that he'd sent in has saddened him deeply. He's also worn and anxious because the winds have turned to this very baffling direction. They may prevent them from reaching St. Thomas until it's too late to make good on the second part of the mission. Two ships, two of these ships representing 40% of the guns and 50% of their broadside weight of metal are themselves in very bad order. Neither is a happy ship. Both are commanded by men, in Jack's view, not fit to command. One is a sodomite at odds with his officers. The other is a bloody tyrant, a flogger who'd have a mutiny on his hands if Jack didn't continually check him. It's noticeable that Jack doesn't name the officers and name the vessels, but it's really plain to us, as it's plain to Stephen, that he's talking about the Thames and the stately here, and therefore talking about Thomas and Captain Duff. Yeah, and Jack gets a little silent after this. And, and to break the silence, Stephen suggests that constant exercise in colder seas might improve the two sick ships' health. And Jack says, well, it would take a pretty long haul and a complete change of heart with a man like the Purple Emperor, who has no heart to change and only a set of pompous attitudes. But Jack does allow that the offshore squadron has been pretty idle and that cold seas can do wonders. And Jack asks Stephen if he could hold his cello if he was propped up with some cushions. Oh. Well, when Huell comes aboard the Bologna from the Crestos, where he's been for all this action, he asks how the doctor is. And Jack nods aft to the deep, melodious, though somewhat unsteady sound of the cello. It takes more than the yellow jack to come to an end of him, Jack says. Yeah. Huell reports that Wida, the big grand slave market, is empty. There's not a slaver left. The news of the squadron has run ahead of them finally. But Jack is glad. He takes Huel in to see Stephen, tells Stephen the news about Whitehall. And Jack says he's glad because he really can't spare any more officers or men for prize crews. And it'll allow them to go ahead and head for St. Thomas. But first, he wants to stand in, say farewell to the brigs and schooners. And he says, give the great slave market a salute that will put the fear of God into them going forward. <laughs> and we know he's good at that already from uh, how he did just a few chapters ago. Well, Huel goes on and asks Stephen about his trip up the river with Square. And Stephen says, well, thank you for recommending Square. It was a short but very good trip, kind of skirting past the fact that he came down with the yellow fever as a result. 
He'd seen a potter, he says, but was unable to bring it home. This is another great moment for Huel to step in and help us out and help Stephen out. He says, aboard the Cestus, he's got a potto, a female Calabar Awantibo, another kind of potto without a tail. He'd bought it for Stephen in the marketplace. Stephen's really delighted with his very generous, thoughtful act on Huel's part. And as they're sailing it towards the shore here up on deck, Huel points out the slave harbour of Wydar. And Stephen's surprised, first of all, by the lack of a harbour. And Huel says, well, there aren't very many real ports along this part of the coast. The Dahomey people are an inland warlike nation, and they make their conquests and do their trade by conquest inland, um, capturing slaves to trade for European goods. They don't know the sea, so trading with outsiders is done in, in this kind of frightful surf without any fixed harbour walls or any fixed ports. And since they export many thousands of slaves a year, Wydar has grown considerably as a result with English and French and Portuguese quarters and some Arabs and some people from neighbouring parts of Africa called Yorubas. Now, Mike, this, this Awantibo Poto, it's a very cute sounding name. Do we know something else about it? Well, yeah, it's it's sometimes called the golden potto because of its color. It's a close relative to the common potto, also to lorises, lives in West African rainforest, takes its name from the Nigerian city of Calabar. Um, so that orangish yellow fur and then, you know, a kind of a nice markings on the head. We, we can put out some social media on it. And for those of you who've kind of, you know, run through all your Kama Sutra illustrations, this particular <laughs> potto mates upside down hanging from the branches. Well, which of us hasn't wanted to give that a go, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've heard a bit about the king, and we've heard a bit about the absence of big harbours, but we have heard that they're quite a warlike nation. And the king's great town, this town Abome, is a long way inland. And Stephen asks for a description of it, and Huell describes this great walled town. He says, the people there seem to look down upon me, look down upon Huell, not just because they were taller, but out of this really strong sense of pride, Huel had brought down a dozen chests of capital iron hats for the king's Amazons, so he was treated well. And we, we talk a little bit about these Amazons, these female warriors of the uh, the Abome people. They were said to be terrible and fearless, says Huel, and had the, uh, the, the post of honor in battle. They would attack first. And they, they, they share this little bit of amazement, and Huel owns up to this episode that he's had in, in his past when a pack of female sergeants from these warriors had come into her, his hut, and uh, they had, to use his very delicate phrase, used him shamefully. And at, at, at this moment, Stephen changes the subject back to the potto. But Mike, let, let's hear a little bit about the, the, the Amazons. Is, it, is this a real connection? It, it really is. It, this is an actual all-female military regiment. It, it, it lasted from the 17th century until the late 19th century. It's one of the few documented female armies in modern history. You know, the name Amazons came from Western Europeans who are referring back to the Greek mythology. Locally, they were called Mino, you know, our mothers, and especially the male soldiers referred to them that way. Sometimes Ahoshi, the, the king's wives. But these folks, I mean, they were trained with intense physical exercise. They learn survival skill, indifference to pain and death, sometimes kind of compared to the Spartans, if you will. And serving in the Mino offered women an opportunity to rise to positions of command and influence in an environment structured for individual empowerment. You know, it, it was really a meritocracy. They were wealthy. They held high status. They actually moved on to take a prominent role in the Grand Council. So, you know, influencing the course of this nation here. And, you know, once again, O'Brien's showing us how women kind of find a way to find a voice in the patriarchy yeah, here. That's great. Isn't it? Now, there are many references across here, one being Marvel's Black Panther. Uh, you know, the warriors and bodyguards there are in part based on the Dahomey Mino. Oh, fantastic. You've got to wonder whether the Marvel scriptwriters had read any O'Brien then at this point. <laughs> I'm certain the, the reverse can't be true. Anyhow, <laughs> um, You're right. It, it, it's great that Stephen and Huel have picked up on this connection to these warriors here. Um, Huel gets back onto the subject of pottos and says this particular potto that he's got for Stephen had belonged to a popish missionary. Uh, this guy's housekeeper was selling everything left. She'd given Huel books and papers and the potto. And everyone thought that the potto was a Roman fetish 
and that buying it might offend local spirits. Mike, can, can we dig a little bit here into the, the, the this idea of fetish? This doesn't just mean, you know, fancying somebody with their ankles on display now, does it? No, no, no. <laughs> and, and thank you, Karen Ruff, our, our consulting Latinist. This is actually an old kind of from the Portuguese um, and and O'Brien uses that early Portuguese spelling. It's really talking about an animal worship for its magical powers, sort of like you would have a charm or an amulet. So, or an amulet. So this is, you know, the locals are thinking this is kind of the Romans' version of a spirit ah, animal or something here. Very good. So a, a better understanding of what fetish means that's going to help all of us, I think. Now, this potto that Huel's got is still in Huel's ship because the seas at the, this moment are too rough to bring her by boat across to the Bellona. And Huel, meanwhile, passes on one of the books that he'd got from this uh, Popish missionary's um, housekeeper, Elzevies Pomponius Mela de Situ Orbis. Put a pin in that. And a breviary, a Roman Catholic service book, worn almost a destruction, and a thick notebook. And the notebook's got African language translations and reflections and letters and drawings and notes about this potto. And if you wanted to, Mike, I'm sure we could dig deep into Elzevier, which was a, a Dutch publishing house whose name was the inspiration for the modern day publishing house, spelt differently but still pronounced Elzevier. And Pomponius Mella was a Roman geographer. His book, De Situ Orbis, on the situation of the world. Again, thanks to Karen, our consulting Latinist, noting that this work was read and copied in the Middle Ages, but became popular with Renaissance humanists in the 15th century and was then uh, printed rather than copied by hand in 1471. Interestingly, Pomponius was the first to assert the existence of antichthonies, what we, we might call antipodes, countries on the other side of the world or opposed Earth, and thinking or supposing that that must mean that the climates would be opposite um, and that the two would be inaccessible from each other uh, because of what he thought of as the intervening torrid belt. So an early idea of what a circular globe might mean. Now, Huell, having handed over these great artifact and made a promise of the potto apologizes he says he has to head back to the squadron to carry orders for a 21 gun salute stephen asks the reason for the 21 guns and mike there's an important point here about the beneficiary of the 21 gun salute well it, it really is Ian. and boy this really really caught me up short a little bit he'll says that it's to impress Whitehall and the king, and, and it's justified because today is the birthday of a semi-royal, the Duke huh. of Havokstall. And I'm like, uh-oh, you know, bum, bum, bum. I'm, I'm getting the Spanish Inquisition music in the background here for that. <laughs> and, and the text says that ill-omened name was never wholly remote from Stephen's thought, but today it had retreated farther than usual, and the sudden, wholly unexpected sound of it cast a singular damp upon his happiness. So, you know, a very vivid reminder that although Stephen's recovered and the mission's gone well, all still has not gone well at home. And Ian, what else comes to mind with this reference? <laughs> well, the, we know about the role that the Duke has played in the story so far. We're learning here that he's not only important to Sir Joseph Blaine and to Stephen Maturin and to Jack Aubrey, we're learning that his name is well known enough in far-flung places that he becomes the subject of a public 21-gun salute. Hold on to the thought that people in all parts of the world know about and hear about the doings of the Duke of Habakstal. I won't say any more for now. So if you want to take a flip back through the paragraphs, or maybe get open your Kindle and do a search and go back for when have we previously thought about the Duke of Habakstal, that might be a good moment. And while you're doing that, uh, Mike and I are going to go and get a glass of something cool, and we'll be right back after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hold. Welcome back. I hope you found all those references to the Duke and remember what an important part of the story he is here. Mm. Well, Stephen's sitting there reading the old missionary's notes about the Pado until this prodigious bellowing uproar of the Bologna's first discharge sounds, you know. And the text says that several thousand people on the shore fell flat covering their heads. And Stephen thinks, 
and Jack was right. You know, the slave trade had received a setback worth a thousand times the cost of powder for this salute. <laughs> People are going to remember this. And he's interestingly not worried about his potto, you know, which he knows is on the crest with Yule up closer. He says, creatures that lived within the zone of tropical storms with the enormous thunder breaking just over their heads could put up with anything the Royal Navy might be able to offer, particularly those who slept all day with their heads between their knees. <laughs> oh, great. Um, anyway, meanwhile, Yule and Square have finally managed to bring this potto on board to Bellona, and Stephen takes her down to his cabin in the Orlop. He doesn't trust Jack not to talk loud and chuck her under the chin because Jack's pretty tone deaf when it comes to dealing with sensitive animals, as we remember from w wombats and sloths and all the others. So he's going to save an encounter with Jack until the Potto's used to life aboard ship. He stays up late watching her come out after sunset, sees her snatch one of the cockroaches that wanders into her cage. He goes through to the midshipman's berth on the way up to see Jack, and all the midshipmen jump up and greet him. They're glad to see him. The two master's mates are on hand then to give Stephen a little, you know, hands to the elbows and lead him up to the upper deck and the quarter deck. And there's Jack. And Jack's kind of surprised to see Stephen come in. He kind of assumed that Stephen had been sleeping in his cabin. He's been walking around quietly all evening. And Stephen explains he's been watching his potto. And he compliments the young men in the cockpit, that is, in the midshipman's berth. Jack says, well, they are settling down, growing far less obnoxious, and one or two of them may become a seaman in 50 years or so. Yeah. He hopes that, you know, some of them gave Stephen a hand coming back up from the Orlop. That's a long way. Stephen says, well, it was more like mutual support because his strength is coming back hand over fist. And O'Brien says that while Stephen was lying shamefully with one half of his mouth, the other half spoke gospel truth. So his strength really is coming back. And now it's, it's a great time for that because most of the sick from the inshore vessels have been moved aboard the Bologna. Stephen's well enough to start doing rounds again. There's lots of fevers, three cases of yellow jack on there. And on deck, the master tells Stephen that the winds have been excellent, the best that anybody can remember for quite some time. And he says Stephen's potto has brought luck to the ship. And a Marine officer says, an old African hand says, there's nothing like a potto for luck. After all, he adds, there's a potto's field in the Bible, is there not? And the potto's field is kind of an Aubreyism of the potter's field in the Bible from Matthew 27, 6, about the money that Judas gave back to the priest uh, for turning Jesus in and that they bought a field previously used by potters for its red clay and turn it into a burial ground for those who could not be buried in an Orthodox cemetery. Nowadays, we call that a field that is being used for people who can't afford a grave or for a common grave. At supper, then, Jack asks Stephen if it's true that two of the men with yellow Jack are, in fact, on the mend. He has spent hours convincing those patients' neighbours that the men were not infectious and assuring the patients themselves that they had a fair chance of living if they held on with all their might and did not despair. Stephen clearly able to offer an example from his own illness. Although the first patient, who was very far gone when he arrived, had died quickly, Stephen reports that these remaining two are likely, he says, to find another way to heaven. Oh, what a, what a nice way to put it. Or he might have said, live to be hanged, but he was being nice, what? so he said, find another way to heaven. <laughs> Jack nods and says, that was a fabulous stroke bringing your potto aboard. I, might, I, I, I read this and thought, yeah, okay, fair enough. But Stephen clearly hears the old Jack superstition and is not having any of it. Why, your soul to the devil, Jack Aubrey, for a vile, wicked pagan and an infamously superstitious dog to be so weak, cried Stephen, nettled for once. Oh, I beg pardon, said Jack, blushing. I, I did not mean that at all, not at all. I only meant it comforted the hands. I'm sure your physic did them a power of good too. I make no sort of doubt about it. <laughs> so uh, Stephen's still a little bit prickly, I think, in his uh, convalescence here. And Jack is still very, very aware of his, uh, his ability to accidentally offend his close friend here. Right. Now, good fortune in the potto not the sole cause of salvation. Stephen's physic, not the sole cause of salvation. 
Now we do get a reference to potentially a true cause of salvation. Right, right. You know, in addition to psychoneuroimmunology, which apparently <laughs> Stephen was born way, way earlier than everybody else, you know, they, they see St. Thomas on the horizon. And to your point, Ian, Stephen cries, there is our salvation. And Jack is immediately suspicious. He knows that Stephen is always promising, you know, there's a cousin of the phoenix. There's a curious wren. There's some parthenogenic lizards. We have to stop and see them. And he's not going to be setting Stephen down for another timeless ramble on shore. But Stephen reminds him that he's been telling him for over a week now that they've got this desperate shortage of Jesuits bark, which is needed to treat fevers. Mm. And St. Thomas has the finest quality Jesuit bark. Well, all Jack can remember is, you know, once making a joke about a Jesuit's bark being worse than his bite, we remember it too from 13 Gun Salute, where we also <laughs> saw the parthenogenic lizards, as we did in the far side of the world. But Jack, looking at Stephen, says, you know, OK, this guy's looking earnest. He's looking guileless. So, all right, it's got to be a touch and go stop. No more than a day. But then he remembers, oh, my gosh, this is St. Thomas. It's not an English port. We've got all these formalities we're going to have to go through. It's going to take longer. Oh, and we're looking at that. How many pages are left in this book thinking we're on chapter nine out of ten here? We can't get stuck with another load of formalities here. So we're kind of wondering what's going to happen. Well, the formalities get taken care of. Stephen convinces the authorities that even though they have come from the slave coast where there was an outbreak of plague three years ago, they can come on shore 100 paces above the high tide mark without waiting out quarantine. Exactly how he makes his case, we're, we're not left to find out. As they gather their bark, the second lieutenant of the Thames and the young marine officer who had been Stephen's neighbour at the recent dinner, together with their seconds, wander off a little, fight a duel, shoot each other in the belly and are carried back to their respective ships. And how, how long must they have been miserably waiting for this moment? How grim that they're both pretty clearly gravely wounded and taken back to their ships with the issue undecided, the stately's manliness and fighting qualities still in question. And Jack expresses the hope that the young Marine doesn't die, worries that Duff might hang himself if he does. and. Both men, it turns out, do die, but not before the Thames's man, encouraged by his chaplain, sends over an apology saying that he was wrong. And the Marine sent back best wishes for a prompt recovery. And although it's a nice heartwarming moment, if you like, that they got reconciled, it's still a grim waste, right? That if those sentiments were in place with all the blood having been shed, presumably there was a world in which those two sentiments could have been found before these two guys had mortally wounded each other. This is all still lost, however, on the ship's companies. The two ships continue their hostility toward one another. There are all these uh, rude remarks hollowed backwards and forwards on the rare occasions that they're close enough to be heard. So, Mike, this tension in the squadron here is not going away. No. But thankfully, there are very few occasions that they're close enough to holler back and forth because they're good winds and Jack is driving the squadron. He's haunted by the dread of arriving too late to intercept the French. Right. He even yeah. forbids the ships to reduce sail to allow him to come aboard more easily when he visits. He still can't get Duff to take a hint. He shifted the stately's first lieutenant, who was the one you know, kind of bringing the strongest case against Duff, moved him over to another ship. And they sailed 10 days for Freetown. It would have been eight, except for the slow Thames. And on the journey, the ships returned back to their natural routines, their ceremonies of long blue water sailing. And Jack and Stephen returned to their suppers and music most nights. So mm. glad to hear that. It's great, isn't it? Just briefly, we're back into the world of huh, companionship and Boccherini. Um, but Stephen has to spoil it by d digging into the topic of same-sex relationships. Stephen asks Jack one night about, as he calls it, sodomy in the Navy, and says that even though there's so much talk about it, and it's repeated and talked about in the Articles of War, he can only remember one time, we, he's referring here to Master and Commander, and he's referring to uh, one crew member's uncontrolled passion for a goat, which is not quite the same thing as same-sex relationships between men, but yeah, never mind, it's the 18th century attitude there. Um, he's surprised then that it's ever come up on one of their ships. And Jack says, it's not surprising you haven't been exposed to it because there are so few opportunities for, as he calls it, such capers, so few private spaces on a man of war. However, Jack goes on and describes this particularly horrid case involving a Captain George Coburn of HMS Maliga, 
producing confidential letters to and from a Captain Sawyer of HMS Blanche. There's evidence of Sawyer's guilt. Coburn hadn't want Sawyer's offices to be ruined or for Sawyer to remain captain. And the judges had found Sawyer not guilty of the article of war breach of sodomy, but had convicted him of gross indecency and dismissed him the service. And Jack goes on to explain how Sawyer had been replaced by uh, an Irishman, he believes, called Darcy Preston, of the Gormanston family, says Stephen. And we have this little note about how the uh, the Gormanston family had come to their end. Eventually, as this story drew to a close, the entire ship's crew had had to be broken up and split among other ship's crews. And Coburn, Sawyer, Darcy Preston, and the Irish Gormanstons are all real and realistic references. And it's an odd little moment here of kind of puzzling and picking over this this prejudice and these problems in the Navy around same-sex relationships. It is interesting that that uh, Dar- Darcy Preston that he mentions here is actually the name, but it was not an Irish one. It was an English one. Right. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> he wasn't, it wasn't part of the Gormanstons. But interestingly, the Gormanstons, who have a fox in their family of arms, there's this legend that every time the head of household is about to die, all the foxes gather in front of the main entrance to the family home. So... Yeah, that was Stephen's reference. Sadly, not not for this Darcy Preston. Well, we have foxes gathering at the rear entrance to our stately home every night, and I'm pretty sure it's nothing to do with uh, <laughs> family legend. <laughs> well, as we so often do, Jack suggests, let's go back to our port in Baccarini, right? Noting how well the port stands up in this heat. But Jack's playing indifferently because after this conversation, as you had said, his heart is no longer in the music here. And, and Stephen's a little worried when he brought this topic up. Stephen consoles himself, reflecting that salt water washes all the way and another hundred miles of perfect sailing will raise Jack's spirits. And he hopes that Freetown will see Jack's difficulties resolved. Well, they sail into Freetown, the Ringle having preceded them, and Government House immediately throws out the signal inviting all captains to dinner. And it, Mike, this has increasingly got the feeling of a kind of valedictory lap of honour here for the squadron. Uh, the Bellona's barge is newly painted. Everyone's dressed in style. Maybe trying to outdo the stately. We'll see. Some of the bargemen, though, are looking aft with disapproval at the surgeon and his man. In the words of the text, shabby, unbrushed, and carrying an old green umbrella, badly furled. And I'm sure we're having our attention drawn to this just so we can notice that Stephen was not looking his dapper finest the first time he set ashore here in Freetown. Hold that thought. They can't believe, the crew can't, that Killick is letting the doctor go out looking like that, and they console themselves knowing that he's not going directly to the governor's palace. He's going to see Humusias, right? Yeah, and, and he goes to see him, but finds out that Humusias is off traveling. So Stephen sends Square home to see his family, and he says, you know, I'm going to go walk over and view the swamp here. Because that went so well last time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. And he hears these people calling out behind him, doctor, doctor. And he says, well, you know, they're looking for a doctor. I hope they find one. He keeps walking and finally they catch up to him, says the Commodore says, come directly that his excellency has invited you to dinner. He says, well, you know, please send my compliments and regrets that I'm unable to accept. But a tall, powerful Marine sergeant and three determined master's mates convince him that, no, no, you know, we we were sent to bring you there and that's what we're going to do here <laughs> not the first time that somebody's been sent to purloin Stephen into a meeting a social engagement but remember he's not looking his best and we are expected to remember the shabby green umbrella at this point now he gets to the governor's mansion governor apologizes for the last minute invitation uh, he had wanted he said the honor of meeting him and when his wife had heard that Dr. Stephen Maturin was in Sierra Leone and was not planning to dine with them, she was infinitely distressed, quite put out. And he introduces Stephen to Christine Woods, a very good-looking young woman, it says here, tall, fair, agreeably plump, smiling at him with the utmost benevolence. And... Uh, Stephen apologizes for his appearance, realizing that you know, the the ship's boat's crew were right. <laughs> He's appearing in what he calls a squalid... Uh, we, we don't get to hear squalid what, because um, she cuts him off saying, not in the least, he's covered with laurels, you know, meaning the, 
the symbols of victory, she introduces herself to him as Edward Heatherley's sister. And she says she's read all his books and read his address to the Institut in Paris, which Monsieur Cuvier had sent to Edward. And Mike, as I think we've looked for before, um, Heatherley and his sister, Christine Woods, are not people that we can find real references to, but maybe somebody out there has found one. But anyway, these are characters that are important to telling this story. Yeah. And, and because we don't have any real history, Stephen gives us one from our Brian here, <laughs> says that, oh, yeah, Edward, right, a naturalist, a member of the Royal Society, has a modest estate in the north of England, where he and his sister had spent time collecting, botanizing, drawing, dissecting, and comparing you know, he had told Stephen once that his sister knows bones far better than he did and was unbeatable by anybody on bats. Stephen is thinking all this through his head and he replies to me, Miss Christine, I'm delighted to see you, ma'am. And now I do not mind my squalor in the least. And at the end of dinner, she asked Stephen to come by tomorrow to see her garden and creatures, including a chanting goshawk and a brush-tailed porcupine. And the text says, she says, Perhaps you might like to see my bones. Nothing could possibly give me greater pleasure, said Stephen, pressing our hands. And perhaps we might walk by the swamp. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, oh, Brian, Brian's having fun now. Oh, Stephen, too. Yeah, right? I'll show you my bones if you show me your garden. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah there yeah, we yeah. go. <laughs> right. Oh, dear me. Anyhow, Stephen says that Jack had seemed to be enjoying himself at the other end of the table. And I, I'm remembering that Lately, public dinners in the last few books have often not been comfortable times for Stephen or for Jack, but it's all been going fine here. Jack says that members of the vice admiralty court and the civil secretary were telling them how much wealthier they're going to be when everything is settled up, especially if they are, they're, they're not taken aback by any appeals from the American and Spanish owners of these ships. The hands' undisputed share is already sitting in canvas bags in the treasury, ready to be paid out. And Jack says that now it's the dry season. Surely, he says, Stephen's not going to keep the crew aboard all night. And Stephen says he will not. Jack knows exactly then what the result of them going ashore is going to be. Stephen says the glee radiating from Jack is more than prize money. And he asks if he's heard from the Admiralty. Jack says he hasn't. But he does have letters from home and one from Spain. Ah, oh, Mike, let's hear about the letter from Spain. Ah, yeah. Well, Clarissa writes that all is well. Bridget is healthy, affectionate, biddable, talkative, and tolerably correct in English. She's also speaking some Spanish, but she still prefers the Irish. She speaks with Padine. She's writing, but she isn't sure which hand to use. So she's a pretty amazing girl here. And Clarissa says it for herself. She has a quiet, very agreeable life. She's reading more than she ever has. She loves the nuns singing and enjoys the visits and carriage rides from the local villagers mm -hmm. and from Stephen's cousins, two of whom had reported wolves close to the road in this kind of cold season here. And she sends Bridget's wolf drawing with a handwritten phrase along the bottom. And Stephen's having trouble making that out until he realizes, wait, this is Irish written phonetically. Oh, my father... Farewell, Bridget. Oh, yeah. That's a lovely moment. It's a, it's a little bit of the kind of normality that I think Stephen was hoping for, for Bridget. Right. Oh. And I'm just glad it didn't have to have this kind of fairy mystical association with her speaking <laughs> Irish that we had earlier on. So that's great. Jack comes in then. And remember, we saw Glee bouncing off Jack earlier on. We get a little explanation of where that's come from. He has received delightful letters from Sophie, he says, and he intends to answer them immediately and send them with a merchantman that's about to leave for Southampton. But here's the telling phrase. He asks Stephen, how do you spell Peccavi? And of course, the attentive reader remembers that Stephen had given Jack advice about Sophie in chapter six. He said, crawl flat on your belly, roaring out Peccavi, meaning I have sinned and beat your bosom. And it's great, Mike. It makes me smile that Jack is taking the advice and apologizing with no further reservation here. Yeah. Well, we've got you know Jack happy, and then we see Stephen swinging in his cot later that evening, thinking about Christine Heatherly, you know, the uh, governor's wife, here, <laughs> wondering if, as the text says, her physical presence has stirred some long dormant emotions in my 
let us say, bosom. No. And then he turns and yeah. he says, no, no, no. No, my motives are entirely pure. She's as safe with me as she is with her grandfather, or at least with an uncle. <laughs> and can't stop. Well, what does that say about, about Irish her? uncles? But never mind. <laughs> yeah, where are we out here, right? You know, and he's thinking about this gentle pressure of her hand on his, and he decides that, well, you know, out of respect for her and government house, I'm going to have Killick get my best wig all ready and go pay her a visit tomorrow. <laughs> what was it about self deception a few chapters ago? Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. And it's funny. I'd, it's the first time that Stephen has been properly tempted by, honestly, a relationship with somebody other than Diana, I think. I mean, so Laura Fielding, that was work. Clarissa Oakes, that was business as well, really, I think. But there's yeah. something about this that's kind of f- friendly and bucolic and, and nice, even though, like, as far as we know, Stephen takes his vow seriously. And Stephen is has all the way through this book, we've been longing on his behalf for news about where Diana is at. So right, right. it's quite a nice, uh, I'm going to call this a nice little moment for O'Brien to draw us in to a world in which there's some good news on the romantic side for Stephen that doesn't have to do with Diana. But let's hold that thought. For all Stephen is ready with his uh, fr- you know, fresh razor blade and his best powdered wig, he gets undercut here in true Patrick O'Brien style. Tomorrow brings what they call a smoke, a harmattan, a strong, dry, dusty seasonal wind with red grit that makes boat travel and pretty much being outdoors anywhere impossible. Square says it's only a small one. It'll be over in a day or two. And Stephen really hopes that he's right because besides wanting to go ashore and uh, strut in front of Christine, um, he also wants to see Mr. Hermusios, the intelligence contact come money changer, and Jack shows Stephen his sea chest, the sea chest that he's had for decades at sea, survived all kinds of weather, and this dry dust storm has split the lid from one end to the other. And they're turning the fire hoses on the ships to keep all the uh, the boats in one piece. That's remarkable. I, it, it seems to me it's such a vivid visual thing that it must be a symbol for something, Mike, but I, mm. I couldn't work out what it's a symbol for. No, it's a, it's a great question, Ian. Well, Thursday, the storm is over and a very close shave Stephen visits Government House with a gift of sunbird skins arranged with their feathers outward as beautiful as any bouquet, mm-hmm. you know, the text says. Christine spots his sedan chair coming up the drive, hollers that she'll be down in a minute and puts on what O'Brien calls a singularly becoming cashmere shawl. They have coffee and she shows him her bones. Sorry, I had to indulge in <laughs> O'Brien humor for a minute. There's there's no indication that Stephen jumped them, but I, I suspect the thought crossed <laughs> okay. his mind. Okay. Anyway, the bones, the actual bones, all of her collection are beautifully arranged. They discuss their differences with Linnaeus on classification of bats, a point on which they both emphatically agree. And then she kind of has the real showpiece. She shows Stephen a potter's bones. And the text says, ah, said Stephen, delicately taking up the skeletal hand, how I have longed to see these phalanges. Do you happen to know whether in life this aborted index finger had a nail? He had none, poor dear. He seemed so conscious of it. I often saw him gazing at his hand, looking puzzled. He lived with you so? Oh, yes, for nearly 18 months. And how I wish you were living yet. One grows absurdly attached to a potto. Oh, it's a really, really lovely moment. And we're, we're right there with them. By the way, so, so much of the action of this book has taken place a, a little bit at one remove. It really intensifies your feeling here that you're sitting with these two people as this exchange is taking place, live on TV, as you might say. Stephen examines the bones in silence, turns to her and says, Dear Mrs. Wood, may I ask you to be very kind to me? Dear Mr. Maturin, she replied, blushing, you may ask me anything you like. Wait, 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 Mike, this is this is some kind of naturalist foreplay going on here. <laughs> Maybe Stephen Maturin isn't the only one who's been pondering yesterday's visit. That that was not an ambiguous signal put out by uh, by HMS Christine there. That was a pretty much a... Uh... Anyway, never mind. Um, Stephen comes right out and says what's on his mind. He says, I too am absurdly attached to a potto. He says, 
a tailless potter from old Calabar. An Awantimo, she cried, recovering from her surprise. Stephen bowed. She has been grievously on my mind since we left those parts. I cannot in conscience take her north of the tropic line. I have not the resolution to kill and anatomize her. To abandon her to a local tree in unknown surroundings would go against my heart. Oh, how well I understand you, she said, taking his hand in the kindest manner. Leave her with me, and I will look after her with the utmost care, for her sake and yours. And if she dies, as my dear Potto died, you too shall have her bones. <laughs> oh, I can I can just hear resounding in my mind, Princess Bride. Ah, oh, true love. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, in the marketplace, we learn now what was making Stephen so anxious to find Hamusius, that the dry wind which has cracked Jack's sea chest had also cracked the caddy that Stephen had containing his coca leaves. The cockroaches had swarmed in and oh. fouled whatever they didn't eat. So he's starting to feel the absence. He's jonesing a little bit here. <laughs> and, and luckily, Hamusius is in the market and he tells Stephen, oh, I have your leaves for you and takes him to his house. But at the house, you know, some of the other real intelligence business takes place place as he passes Stephen three messages which have arrived. Stephen thanks him for all his help and suggests that he purchase East India stock as soon as it drops below 116. <laughs> That's a little, ooh. Stephen's in a very unaccustomedly sort of free with his, he's never given stock tips to anybody he's in, in his life. But all of a sudden right. he's picked up his barrel of coca leaves and he's dropping hints like he's the back page of the Wall Street Journal, honestly. Something, something is going on here, Mike. I can't work out what it is. Right. Well, it, th th that's one kind of masculinity. We learn about another kind of masculinity as they're headed back to the ship. They're blocked by a turbulent mass of seamen from the Thames and the Stately, either fighting or about to fight. And some moderately sober members of the Bologna ship's company, including some of Stephen's old surprise shipmates, close in around Stephen and Square and protect them and help them through the crowd. And Mike, I... I couldn't decide whether this is sort of an ongoing rumble of a warning that there's still ill will between the Thames and the Stately or kind of a reassurance like, yeah, they hate each other, but men fight ashore all the time and there's no big deal. So, Right. Yeah, it is. It You know, it, at least nobody's shot in the belly that we know in this one. No, <laughs> exactly. Well, back on board, Stephen reads the three messages, you know, in kind of the order in which they were sent. They're updates on the French squadron. And he learns that the French have received faster transports and may arrive a week sooner than originally expected and may be joined by a third line of battleship, the Caesar, a 74 coming from America. Blaine had also enclosed a half a sheet that was a personal message in he and Stephen's private code. But Stephen, you know, he just can't make it out. He's gone back and forth. He's gone through his entire code book, which he already had memorized. And he's almost certain that one of the sequences was the combination that Sir Joseph used for Diana's name, but he still has no idea what the message says. Oh boy. Just Ouch. as Stevens Oh, just as Stevens getting warm and friendly with Christine Heatherly, we get a reminder that maybe, maybe there's still hope for the marriage to Diana. Ah. Anyhow. Stephen finds Jack. He's with Tom. They are gazing at their chronometers, and they've got a uniquely nautical conundrum here. These two chronometers no longer agree with each other, one or perhaps both deranged by the dry dust storm. And it's odd that you know, ha having two is no backup, actually. You, you needed three or one that was just super reliable. Jack sees the look on Stephen's face and takes him immediately into his cabin. He he says he's glad the news had arrived in time. The news he means about the César and the 74 and the French being earlier. He tells Stephen to replenish his medical stores and sends for Tom. We need to be underway, he says, in 12 hours with the first ebb. We are short-handed, says Jack. And with so many men ashore, hard to find and bring off, we shall be in real difficulties. Send the boats to the last come merchantman and press all you can. So Jack stops Liberty, he sends the Marines ashore, and asks the governor to use his troops to round up as many Bologna stragglers or squadron stragglers ashore as he can. He pauses to make a note that the stores are all in good shape, apart from the gunner's stores, who've just fired a load of uh, gunpowder off in this 21-gun uh, salute. 
But not to worry, they're on their way. Tom begins with the watering and throws out the signal for all captains. And Mike, so suddenly action is afoot. It is. It is. Stephen and his potto and all of his assistants go on shore. The assistants go to replenish the medical stores. And the text says Stephen hurried to Mrs. Wood with his charge, that being the potto, and took his leave. His forced, unwilling leave, as he observed, strangely moved. No young woman could have been kinder. So again, Ian, to your point, you know, we're getting this really strong resonance between Stephen and Christine with this cryptic notion of Diana in the background here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so back on board, Stephen sees the powder hoys casting off. He watches the resigned merchantmen who have been pressed, assigned to their watch and station. Within 11 and a half hours, the Blue Peter, the P flag, which means we're going, uh, breaks out. Um, a few boats and frantic canoes race across to the ship. And here's O'Brien's closing of the chapter. At the 12th hour, the squadron stood out to sea in a perfect line, steering west-northwest with a full topsail breeze just abaft the beam, and the band of the Aurora playing loud and clear. Come cheer up, my lads, tis to glory we steer, to add something new to this wonderful year. To honour we call you, not press you like slaves, for who are so free as we sons of the waves? End of chapter nine. <laughs> yeah. I can't help it but be struck by the irony that here we've had this whole wrap up of a mission to free all these slaves, set thousand free. And now oop, we've got to go press all these seamen who are standing yeah. around in the waist of the ship, you know, going torn from family and, and home and business and everything. And they're listening to people singing, to honor we call you, not press you like slaves, for who are so free as the sons of the waves? Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah, well, and, and it was then, and it still is, the semi-official anthem of the Royal Navy. It's called Hearts of Oak. The final line goes, which is also relevant, I think, to what's going on here. Hearts of Oak are our ships, Jolly Tars are our men, and we'll always be ready. Steady, boys, steady. So, Jack's squadron was ready, and they're off. Uh, Mike, it's, we're just about getting into some naval stuff, only just in time for chapter 10 here. It's been quite the chapter. We've had Stephen's illness, right? We had Stephen's illness, which I thought was really nicely played. You know, we've had Stephen sick several times before. Four, and this might have been the shortest episode page-wise, but it was intense, and it, and it did a really nice job showing how Stephen has matured, just as the way we've been seeing kind of Jack's maturity playing out over the last several books here. Yeah. And we've also had a nice resolution of the African mission, and it's, it's kind of successful but unremarkable. They've scared and disrupted as many slavers as they can. Everybody else who was left in the slave trade has abandoned the place and kind of scooted out ahead of them. They haven't had to have any big showdown. They've just done their job quite effectively and quite publicly, which is what they needed to do. It served as a distraction or a feint for the French, but it also has done some real good. The slavery theme is still echoing in our minds, as you said, Mike, right at the close of this chapter here. So let's hope the weather holds as they're on their way, sailing north-northwest out of the coast of Africa there to meet the French. We've still got tension between two of the biggest ships in the squadron. We've got leadership problems. We hope that they're not going to hinder them too much in the journey. Maybe there's a battle with the French coming if they can reach them in time. Yeah, yeah. And we still haven't heard anything concrete about Diana. We've got Blaine's indecipherable message, which which makes me worry a little bit more. We also seem to have Stephen looking at Christine and questioning himself about his intentions, as we've been talking about here. Now, it seems like we're a little too far into the canon to have Stephen take up Jack's bad ways here. But I'm glad on that note to see that things sound a little bit better between Jack and Sophie. Oh, yes. That's one of the important threads of the first half of the book. Potentially, potentially quite nicely sewn up. I don't quite believe it until we're back with Sophie again. Right. But uh, my, my my heart was warmed a bit by that. So as you say, Mike, it's it's been a full chapter. It's been a long chapter. It's been a good one. Uh, we've moved some of the important strands of the plot along quite nicely. Um, we might actually get away from Africa and across to meet the French still within the same book. I mean, would would O'Brien really do that? I mean, we, it took us how many books to get to Chile? Right. And I, I'm looking ahead, Mike, now to the final chapter next week. We've got a lot to look forward to, right? 
Well, we really do, Ian. What would you say next week to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Mike, with all my heart, that's what I say. Sorry, I was I was absent there. <laughs> the prodigal podcaster has returned.